Good day. Welcome to another edition of Spotlight on Brewster Schools. Eric Gorse, your host, along with Superintendent of Schools, Valerie, Valerie and Piedmont. Hello, my dear. Great. How are good you doing? Seeing you. Great seeing you. It's been Frank, very, great seeing you. Very, oh, I've been seeing Frank. <laughs> it's been an extremely busy time since we last gathered. Belated New Year's greetings, by the way, to one and all. And unfortunately, the flu has arrived in full force in Putnam County. What's the message you have out there? If uh, Johnny or Susie has a little sniffle or a cough or a cold, what do you want them to do? I think parents should keep them home. Mm. You know, the, the, it may seem courageous to send a, a child to school, you know, regardless, but what happens is they end up in the nurse's office, you know, and uh, sometimes there are other children in the nurse's office who have similar issues, and it just, you know, becomes, a, you know, a, an opportunity to spread the, 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 the virus. So we're encouraging parents to keep their children home instead of sending them to school. Um, and that, you know, while they're at home, they can, you know, they can take care of themselves, they sure. can sleep, be nourished, and, you know, drink plenty of liquid. So we encourage our parents to do that. And, and obviously this is a horrific uh, flu season. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, that you can't turn on any news outlet and hear, and not hear how prolific it is and how widespread it is. So we are going to take it very seriously. And we obviously don't want it to escalate into something much more serious because unfortunately there have been episodes, you know, where children, yes. you know, have died yes. from, from 37 the, 30, 37 students, uh, yeah. children. So yeah. we have to take it seriously and I encourage parents to take it seriously. And obviously all the other things that we do, um, we should continue to do, you know, wash our hands multiple times during the day, you know, not take our, put our hands on our faces, make sure we're drinking plenty of good right. liquids, you know, use our sanitizers. So uh, we'll get through this. Okay. Snow day is another interesting topic. It was that a lot of snow in the beginning of the month, a lot of snow in December, and so far, so far so good. We have two snow days left. We have two snow days left. We've had a few which have saved us. I think we could have probably um, had, you know, exhausted our snow days yeah. already because we had, we adopted a couple of years ago the three hour delay, which really helps us. Uh, so we've had a couple of um, uh, uh, delayed openings and early dismissals. Uh, and that has helped us to, you know, to, to stay in school as long as possible without having a full day of disruption. But, you know, Mother Nature rules when these things occur, and safety is always our number one priority uh, because we have our buses traveling in lots of different places in the county, uh, and there are lots of slopes and hills and curves, and we don't want to ever risk opening school uh, and um, at a time where it could lead to uh, an accident. And right in the Brewster School District alone, you have in the downtown Brewster area, it's a low elevation, you get to some of the higher elevations in Putnam Lake, it's like a different world. It is, it's like a ski slope. Yeah. And so that's what we encountered. And so on those days where we had to close, we, that the consideration had to do with, you know, the snow blowing back onto the roadways, uh, icy conditions, and we just can't ever risk uh, a bus, you know, uh, finding itself in a condition like that with our children on it. Well, no snow, but a lot of problems nevertheless in Puerto Rico. The poor people there are still without power. This is months later after the devastating hurricanes. And the Brewster High School is presenting a benefit concert, concert for Puerto Rican hurricane relief. What a great program. Well, it's just a, another example of how, um, you know, generous our staff and our children and our families are. Um, the the uh, Fine Arts Department at Brewster High School is organizing this benefit concert. It'll be Thursday, February 8th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, at the, uh, the PAC, the Brewster Performing Arts Center. Uh, all the proceeds are going to go toward Habitats mm -hmm. for Humanity, so it was an opportunity for these funds to help contribute to the rebuilding of homes. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to look at you know, very many things to see how devastated that 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 island still is. So this is just an amazing opportunity for our, us here in Brewster to, to, to give back and, and I thank the, the Fine Arts Department for facilitating this effort. Andrew Perdico is heading up the program. Let's say hi. Well, the hills might not be alive with the sound of music on February 8th, but the PAC Center show will be, and we're talking about the Puerto Rican Benefit Concert. Andrea Perdica is with us now, the music lady here at Brewster High, and you're excited about this, aren't you? I'm very excited about it, yes. We have a bunch of different groups coming together. Our step team is performing. All of our bands are performing. Uh, both orchestras are performing. And uh, many of the clubs in the school have gotten involved to raise money for this really important uh, cause that doesn't seem to be in the news right now, but uh, Puerto Rico could really use some help right now. It's almost forgotten about. That's the sad part. Yes. The, um, half 
of Puerto Rico is still without power. Uh, it's just, they don't even know if they're going to get it until maybe May. So it's very sad. It's just so great that so many of our students want to get involved. Um, I love it that it's not just music kids. Our sports kids are getting involved. They're collecting money um, at several games throughout the month of January, some home games, varsity clubs, Salty Hands, Habitat for Humanity, because that's where the money's going. Uh, Habitat for Humanity in San Juan, Puerto Rico, to help build houses and repair houses uh, throughout the island. Is there an admission fee if people just make a donation? There is. There's an admission fee. It's $6. We actually put it on the school website, um, our Vendini ticket website. If you do pre-sale, it's $6. If you show up at the door, it's actually $8. Uh, we really want to encourage pre-sale. Also, if you do, can't go, you can click on the link and just donate as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. February 8th, the time? February 8th, 6.30 p.m. 6.30 p.m. at the PAC. Brewster Performing Arts Center. Okay, very good. Be there or be square. And if you can't be there, make a donation. Andrew, we thank you. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you. Brewster School District has had national recognition in the last not too distant uh, past, not once, but twice, two national publications. That is no surprise. Uh, we are extremely proud of our uh, math department and, and uh, under the leadership of Ms. Deidre Hollick, who is the uh, advisor to the uh, MOVE uh, Alpha Theta uh, Club. Uh, as a result of their efforts in the Mathathon, uh, the national uh, chapter wants to write up, the mm -hmm. you know, wants to uh, recognize the Mathathon in its uh, national next national newsletter. So that's pretty awesome, and they do all kinds of terrific things, and obviously involves uh, not only high school students, but they, they work with our, lower, our uh, younger children as well. So it's a really uh, significant achievement, and I want to thank Ms. Hollick and uh, the students for uh, making this possible. And the Brewster High School Literary Magazine also received the national honor. Ursus received the 2017 uh, National Council for Teachers of English uh, Achievement Award, um, for its 2017-18 publication. It includes works from students. So this is a student publication and, and both Janine and um, Leslie are the advisors to that, that publication. So it's, that's a significant recognition and I want to thank them for the work that they're doing and I want to thank them for encouraging students to submit their pieces of work which become part of the publication. After school, these kids come in after school to put these pieces together. They absolutely do and for some of them they've been working on pieces because that's of mm -hmm. interest to them. So this is an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to as, which is what we always want to provide and again I'm going to mention in three letters our, SCP, Strategic Coherence Plan, that, you know, without a lot of effort, that publication has existed for many years, but what, it, but what we are doing is putting, you know, attaching the skills to the work that, 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 that they've been, you know, cultivating and developing for many years. So it's a great example of finding a way for children to have an authentic, you know, platform to showcase their work, and that's what that publication represents. Well, let's say hi to Leslie Fine, Jeannie McTeague, and Deidre Hollick right here on Spotlight on Brewster Schools. Well, Valerie, even after school at Brewster High, things are happening. We're here in room 211 where the Ursus Literary Magazine Club is meeting, along with Nancy McTeague and Leslie Fine, the faculty advisors. Ladies, welcome to the show. Some exciting news we understand has come out in regard to the magazine. Yes, last year's magazine was designated um, the title of Excellent by the National Council of Teachers of English, um, their program to promote student literary magazines. So they evaluate them and then they reward them points and we were deemed excellent. How many magazines are judged around the country? Oh my gosh, that's a Thousands? good question. Thousands? Um, it was over 300. It was over 300. I want to say like Hundreds. 370. Yeah. What does that mean to you, Nancy? That's, that's it's Janine. I'm so Janine, sorry. I'm sorry. What does that mean to you? <laughs> it's it's special because it's um, that includes Canada and the Virgin Islands and I think Puerto Rico is in there. And uh, Leslie and I, this was the the first time that we got together to advise the magazine. So our our first time out with this group of of great kids and and we achieved excellent. How do the students become involved in the program? Do they just knock on your door and say we want to write? Absolutely. Absolutely. They don't even really have to knock on our door. Anyone could submit at any time, art or poetry or prose or nonfiction. And then this group is essentially the board that designs the magazine. They decide what gets put in. They offer constructive feedback to anyone who submits so they can, you know, only have the best quality work in the magazine. And um, it works really well. And where does the magazine go? Where is it published and who gets copies of it? 
whoever wants to buy a copy for five dollars <laughs> and then we also give copies to um, each of the the board members and to the administrators and um, and then uh, just for um, former students have bought copies and uh, we actually for the first time we have an alumni section too so we're, we're still in touch with former students that way as well. Should we meet some of the students please let's yeah, go please. ladies welcome you are uh, my name is Diana Neef. What does that mean to you? First of all, writing for the magazine, and second of all, getting this recognition. Uh, it's definitely special. I wasn't actually here when we got this uh, recognition. I joined this year, so it's all very new to me, but I think it's super cool. What about you, Eve? I wasn't here either. Um. <laughs> but it must make you feel very special on knowing you're part of this great club now. Yes. Thank you. Who is here? This young lady right over here. And what is your name? My name's Gabby. Gabby, what does that mean to you? I, um, it's a great honor because mostly everyone in this club is very kind, um, very welcoming, and yeah. <laughs> what kind of topics do you write about? Who wants to, this gentleman right over here, Mr. NJROTC. What is your name, sir? Uh, Will. Will. Yes. What kind of topics do you like to write about? I mean, well, poetry about, so like emotions, perhaps? I mean, like, I just, I, well, I made one submission. Um, I'm, I'm trying to formulate something. I see, I, I mean, I know a friend who he wrote about, like, several things that, um, that do kind of, like, extends from some of his issues. That's, well, I, like, my friend wrote that. But, and, well. You enjoy it? Yes. yes I enjoy it. That's the important. Yes. Anyone else? My friend over here? Yeah, um, actually for me, it's not so much about the opportunities for writing, it's more about uh, increasing my exposure to other works that um, some of the talented students of our high school have um, written recently over the past year. Um, so I think that it's very valuable for me, especially to um, be a part of this community of uh, really strong readers and writers who we all take an interest in assessing the different components of all these different pieces that we get to see and just overall being a part of a community where we can discuss these different pieces and give feedback to people, I think it's really rewarding to be a part of that. That's wonderful. So Leslie and Janine, one more time, where can people get a copy of the magazine? Um, we have a few copies left yeah. of last year's. Not a lot, but a Ten couple. Copies? Ten maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, they give you a call. They could contact us. They could call. They could email. And it's only $5, and it's full of wonderfulness. Yeah. We thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us. The Ursus Magazine, National Honors, here at Bristol High. Mu Alpha Theta, making national headlines. You heard me right. Deidre Hollick is the faculty advisor for the group, and Deidre, the great event takes place this year, April 14th. We'll talk about that in a minute. But first, tell our viewers about this national recognition. Yeah. Um, the national organization of Mu Alpha Theta reached out to me and said they wanted to highlight us in their newsletter for February um, because of the charitable event that we run every year. Um, well, actually, we do more than just the Mathathon, but because of our charitable, charitable events. Um, they wanted us to send some photos and write up a little blurb about the things that we do. So that's exciting. Now, this, of course, benefits St. Jude's Children's Hospital. How much money has been raised over the years? We've raised $40,000 approximately over the last eight years. So this April will be our ninth annual Mathathon. So we're looking forward to doing more. And more and more students get involved. I mean, we're there every year, and the younger kids, and the older students, and working together all for that great cause. Yeah, yeah. We have a, a good turnout every year. I think um, we've had up to 100 third graders, and my Mu Alpha Theta members, sometimes 150 members. So it's a big event. Well, that's wonderful. April 14th. April 14th. We'll be there. Thank you. Thanks and for congratulations. Coming. Thank you. Deidre Hollick. The United Nations Club is, again, one of the many success stories in the Brewster School. started a number of years ago, and these kids get more and more involved. The dedication of the faculty, the staff, the students themselves is unparalleled. 
It is, and under Mr. Tom Mullane's leadership, and he's the advisor to the Model UN, uh, the students have an opportunity to not only you know uh, learn about you know history and social studies and current events and uh, in other countries, they actually get to apply that in the Model UN when they convene on the campus of Columbia University and meet other teens who also have very enthusiastic historic you know students who are interested in history. Uh, these students got a chance to visit a uh, an embassy and mm -hmm. and meet you know uh, uh, actually meet someone who's actually leading uh, you know the, the, the charge uh, you know, to, to maintain peace and, and build relationships with with this country so it's an amazing opportunity and we really thank the students for their interest and hope that they go on to either pursue you know careers in government or perhaps not but you know it's certainly a great platform for them to, to apply what they're learning 800 students from around the world and as you hear one of the students tell us on a little film clip they made friends for life at the UN Club. And they worked tirelessly. Their hours, I mean, they worked until the wee hours of the morning on their preparations. So it, it's not for the faint at heart. And so uh, these are truly uh, examples of our youngsters who uh, enjoy what they're doing and they are they can persevere. You know, obviously it's, it's, it's uh, uh, again, built-in examples of civic responsibility. Again, all of this pre-exists our strategic coherence plan, but this again is an embodiment of all those, those important skills. Let's meet some of the students who solve problems, the past, the present, and the future in Brewster. The Brewster High School United Nations Club had another conference the other day. Twenty students from Brewster High enrolled in the UN Club had their once-in-a-lifetime experience by attending the prestigious Columbia UN Model UN Conference and Exposition in Manhattan. Some of the students are with us today. They're going to introduce themselves. Tom Lane is the faculty advisor for the UN Club. Tom, welcome to the show. Why has this been such a great success over all these years? Uh, well, thanks for having us. Um, I think a lot of the success of the club boils down to the people we have uh, in the room with us today. These guys are uh, officers, leaders in the club, people who help us out. I think this is a great experience for kids, and I think that the people that have been involved in it up to this point have realized that and have gone out of their way to do the legwork to make sure that other people get the same experience that they did. You know, last year, there was a conference here in Brewster High, the first time ever. Yes. Our friend Victor was one of those who organized the whole project there. This year, though, you went back to the Columbia School. Yes. Uh, so last year, we ramped up how many conferences they attended. So I think we went to four. Um, so two locals that only took a day and two full travel conferences that were done over the course of, uh, of four days. So last year, we attended Columbia, and we also went to Cornell University in April. Um, this year, we switched it up, but we still did Columbia, um, and then we're doing a Washington, D.C. conference in, in early March. Mm, wow. Victor, welcome. Thank welcome you. Welcome back. Thank you. Why is this such a great success? I think, really, overall, what Model UN provides for students and for you know adults alike is to find different ways to solve world problems. I think, in my committee, we were able to create so many... Uh, solutions to problems that uh, in the real world you don't see as often. I mean, I had to deal with the situation of creating a policy for healthcare, and the group of students that we had, the group of delegates we had, were able to create this comprehensive healthcare plan that really would be amazing to see in the real world today. So I think Model UN offers an opportunity for students to create those those solutions that could be implemented in the real world, and it's just a it's just a bright and sh it shows the bright future that our generation has because we have so many collaborators, so many good ideas being thrown around. It just really is bringing it together. And once this generation grows up, we're going to see very many good ideas in the future. Akshay, what did you get out of the program? So, of all, it's all about the experience for me. The uh, the idea that you're able to relive past experiences and actually learn from them to show how you could improve that history, which is a lot about, which is a lot of the reason why we take history in school, U.S. history, world history, to improve upon, to learn from your mistakes so that they never happen again. Jane? Uh, I'd like to say that um, I joined the club last year, and part of the reason that I joined the club um, was because I'd heard, oh, it looks good for college. It 
it will encourage you to get better public speaking, you'll improve your writing and research skills through the club. But I've come to realize that it actually um, extends far beyond that. Uh, I don't think I realize the scope of the um, benefits that the students experience from all the problem solving, like Victor said. Um, one of the common misconceptions about Model UN is that it's all about representing countries, it's all modern, but there's a lot of really intensive historical problem solving that happens, and that's something that forces students to think on their feet, and I think it's, um, it's encouraged me to um, ha be more passionate about something in school, it's encouraged me to develop the skills that I'm going to need to succeed later in life, and I think that's why Model UN is so important. Erin. Mm, um, I joined the club last year as well, like Jane, and I just was kind of interested and wanted to see what it was all about, and I'm so happy I joined it. It's definitely one of the best um, decisions I made in my high school um, career so far. And from the conference at Columbia, um, the first thing that I got from it was I learned about this time period in history, um, the Parsley Massacre in the Dominican Republic in Haiti that I didn't really know about it before. So that was like the first um, benefit of the conference and I learned um, how to better collaborate and problem solve with um, people my age. And also I met people from different countries, different backgrounds, um, people with different experiences. So not only do you learn a lot on the um, history level and learn about things in history, but you also just learn more about people as well. And I think that's my favorite part of the club. And Chris? Yeah, <laughs> just, like, just like Victor, I joined the club my freshman year. And like him and Jane said, the, the Things you get out of the club are essentially limitless. I've, I've from these conferences, I have friends all around the world now, all around the U.S. I've become a better public speaker. I've just gained so much from the club. I'm a better researcher, and it's all because of the club and like the, the extra work that we've all put in here. It's really, it's really just been one of the best experiences that I think people can have here at the high school because uh, we're all friends. It's really just a big family. Like everybody when we were at Columbia, we were always hanging out together. We ate all of our meals together. It was, it's really just a big happy family to be honest yeah. and be, without it like I don't know where I would be in the high school it's it's just probably been the best thing that could have happened to be here at the high school and it's it's just amazing and then, like Columbia University it was my third time this year and it's every year it just keeps getting better and better like the things you learn about like time periods you've never heard about like the Persian Revolution I had two years ago I'd never heard about it and it was just this this grand new idea that like I became really interested in just because of being introduced to it through Model UN. And you just you just learn so much, not about history, but also like about yourself and the way that like other people try and approach problems. And it's it's really beneficial to everyone. You know, Tom, talk about a winner. These young people are the future, not only of the Brewster School community, of Putnam County, of New York State. Who knows how far these youngsters are gonna go. No, I think the <laughs> Listening to these kids gives you a pretty good impression of why I've made such efforts to make sure that the club sticks around. Um, to the district's credit, you know they they've supported us. Um, you know we've gotten grants from the BEF. Uh, we've been able to fundraise. The community has been supportive of that. Uh, these kids have slowly built a club that's self-sustaining, where we're able to cover the registration fees of kids going to this conference. So um, we covered the fees about twenty five hundred dollars this year, somewhere around there. So they they fundraise all year to go. Um, and so I'm really proud of them. Like, it's, it's, it's great to see the kind of growth in these kids because I teach a lot of them as sophomores and I think I've, I think I've had everybody here, uh, but like, you see them as sophomores, you see them develop as the club progresses, you see them use the skills that they get and it's pretty obvious who's been a part of it and who hasn't, where not that, not that people are at a huge disadvantage that aren't, yeah. but it's just such a benefit because you see how well these kids can express themselves um, and you see how constructive they are when they're approaching a problem. You see it in just the way they behave and act and think and do. So. Well, the future of the Brewster School District's right here. Congratulations. Job well done. The UN Club, one of the many shining stars at Brewster High. Even though the district has its free and reduced lunch program, on occasion, kids might slip through the cracks and a group of high school students decided to communicate and connect with their community under the direction of Anne Marie McLeod by creating snack bags for children at John F. Kennedy. Well, this was a great collaboration between uh, both uh, Dr. Zamplin and Mrs. Hoylers. And Mrs. Hoylers is the principal of the, of the high school, and Dr. Zamplin is the principal of JFK Elementary School. 
Um, as you know, in our community, uh, we have a 30% uh, free and reduced lunch rate in the school district. Uh, it's that it's 10% higher at, at JFK, so 40% of the children there are qualified for free or reduced lunch. One of the things that we know, Eric, is while you know we can provide breakfast, a nutritious breakfast and lunch for them during the course of the day, once they leave on Friday mm -hmm. afternoon and go home, you know sometimes they don't always have you know a, a nutritious snack or you know, access to those you know to to something nutritious. So it was you know uh, through a lot of you know uh, sort of looking around and thinking about well what can we do about that how can we solve the problem and through Mrs. McLeod and the group of students and Mrs. Hoyler and Dr. Zamplin they came up with a snack attack program which you know allows uh, the school to pack the snacks in, in, in a drawstring bag and mm -hmm. that was donated by I believe um, uh, Brewster High School and the PTA and the the snacks are also donated and and actually my uh, Susan Gavin my secretary um, as a gift for me for Christmas she made a donation to this program. Isn't that, wonderful? Isn't that awesome? That is wonderful. I just love that so much. So this will continue and it will grow, and uh, maybe it'll, perhaps it'll be in other schools as well because poverty has no boundaries, and we want to make sure our children have uh, an opportunity to to maintain, uh, you know, their uh, uh, nutritious access to uh, meals. And before we get over to JFK, there's a young man named Andrew Wider. You got to meet this kid. Seven years old, one of the coolest kids ever. He decided follow up in Val's footsteps and he decided to get his piggy bank containing $15. What was he going to do with it? He turned it over to the JFK School Emergency Lunch Breakfast Program. That is so awesome. So that if a child comes in one day and is without that 50 cents or a dollar or a dollar and a half, he'll have lunch. Talk about civic responsibility, you know, caring about your community, mm -hmm. contributing to your community, and seeing our connection and having that compassion and empathy for others. That is extraordinary, and that's being developed at the earliest places in our school district, and at our, at our K-2 school, JFK Elementary. And, and it's because he obviously is seeing it and hearing it and talking about it. You know, the other part of this is through the PBIS program, the, po the Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. Part of that system is the Good Cubs program, right. and so when do when children do good things, you know they're recognized, and so he's hearing all of that. He's immersed in that, and I'm sure his family, you know, is also equally involved in talking to him about what it means to be a good person and 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 looking at you know how you can help your community. And this is his model, his way of doing it, and I think that's extraordinary. So let's meet Lauren Kraft, Jack Mahoney, and Connor Henderson at Brewster High, then head over to JFK and talk to our friend. Andrew Weider. At Brewster High School, there's a class known as the Government Class, and three seniors here at Brewster High have a unique project that they're working on in the McLeod classroom. A program dealing with snack bags, creating snack bags for children at the John F. Kennedy Elementary School who are on free or reduced lunch. We're talking to Lauren Kraft, Jack Mahoney, and Connor Henderson. Welcome. Thank you. Lauren, how did it all begin? It started by us trying to communicate and connect with all ages of the community, and we wanted the high school kids to connect with the little kids and know that we support them and that we're looking at them too, that no, no person is too small to make a community. Now what about the snack bags? Interesting concept. What's in the snack bags? Um, well, we put a bunch of different stuff, you know, it's not just snacks. We also put uh, try and put arts and crafts and stuff, and we'll theme it um, around like holidays and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, we just put some healthy snacks, you know, some clementines, or try and get some sort of vegetables or fruit in there. But then we'll also have like you know the junk food. We'll put some, <laughs> we'll some, put some cheese it's in there, whatever you know, all that stuff. So and Jack, we understand too that you watch out for the children who might have a food allergy. Yeah. So if a kid has like a nut allergy or anything, we'll take those snacks out of the bag and leave them out. Just there's no... How does it make you feel helping these children out like that, the younger boys and girls? Uh, really good. It's kind of cool that the high school's taking the initiative to help out some of the less fortunate families in the community. Like Lauren was saying, it's just really cool to build that bond between the high school kids and JFK students. So you create the bags here at the high school? Mm -hmm. Do you deliver them also? Yep, we do. I think yeah, uh, usually I'll just uh, put them in my car and drive them over at the end of the day. Right. And um, usually I'll just bring them into the office and leave them there, but I think I might start um, just 
delivering them to the kids, but I don't really know who the kids are exactly. Like, I don't know know them, but uh, I'm gonna start trying to uh, deliver. That would be a great week, yeah. great connection yeah. too. And knowing that you guys are the high school kids, these are little boys and girls, and just that feeling of camaraderie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it might be a cool thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this goes on throughout the school year. Yeah. Our next one, we believe right now we're going to do a Valentine's Ooh. bag. So okay. Very good. Yeah. All right. Great. When are you going to be dropping them off? Um, we didn't set a date yet, but the, around the week of Valentine's. I'll tell you what you're <laughs> going to do. This is live. You let us know. We'll be there. Okay. Okay. Friday okay. night, we'll be there that day <laughs> as you present them. That would be a cool thing. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we'll see your face with the bag. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Lauren, Jack, and Connor, we thank you very much. Bruce to high school kids, middle school kids, elementary, all one big happy family in the Bruce School District. Val, exciting things are happening. Andrew Wyder is a second grader here at the John F. Kennedy Elementary School. And Andrew decided to do something very special in the new year. Turn the money in his piggy bank, the money, the nickels, the dimes, the quarters that he's earned and have been given to him over the past year back to students here at the John F. Kennedy Elementary School. Andrew, why did you turn the money over for the breakfast fund? Just in case people need more lunch or breakfast if they, if they don't have much money in their account. And how did, how did you get all the money over $15? Where did it come from? When I got the piggy bank, my, my mom helped me put some money in there, and I did, so and we put in $15 in the bank. John Conroy is the assistant principal here at John F. Kennedy. You know, John, the future of America is great when you have young men like Andrew White here at JFK. It is. I think we underestimate how many kids we have in the district, and quite honestly, all over the world, right? Kids are wonderful human beings. They need our guidance, and they need the structure to learn. But my goodness, they have so many innate qualities that they bring to us when they walk in the door. We have so many good kids. I know we talk about being good cubs, and he's a perfect example of just a wonderful cub. Andrew comes from a great family, good people. And I'd ask you too, Andrew, just like Mr. Gross, right? You could have spent the money. You could have gone to the store. You could have bought yourself candy. You could have bought yourself a new hat. What made you, and you saved it. And what made you give it to others who are less fortunate, right? So it's just a beautiful story. Now, what happens to this money? Now, we do have a free and reduced lunch program. Valerie and I talk about this each fall, where if families cannot afford a lunch or a breakfast, they should not be ashamed. It's all confidential, and they should contact the school to become eligible for this program. So where does this money go to? This would go uh, above and beyond. So, for example, I had a student that came into school just before the break, and they just had a busy morning at home and they didn't get a chance to eat enough for their breakfast. But that student was so upset when they walked in the door that they felt the need to eat. So we brought that student, no problem, no worries. We brought them down to the cafeteria at the tail end of our breakfast program. But that person wouldn't have qualified for the free and reduced lunch. So this would be those extenuating circumstances because everybody needs a good breakfast. How are you going to start your day and be able to learn how to read, write, or do math if you're worried about the ache in your belly? Okay, well, Andrew, you're a champion. We thank you very much. Congratulations. And keep up the good work. You want to say hi to everybody out there? Hi. Say hi to Mom and Dad. Say hi. Hi, hi Mom and Dad. You have any brothers or sisters? I have Sister Grace and hi, Grace. How many? One. What's the name? I have two. Okay, what are their names? One is in the belly and one is... <laughs> Out, and that one is for them. Okay. <laughs> out of the mouths of babes. Andrew, keep up the good work, and we thank you so much. Well, Val, Dean Grotto's with us. Dean, of course, the director of athletics here in the Brewster Schools, and Dean is always very involved when it comes to those letters of intense signing. <laughs> but today we're talking about a different subject, a subject involving the North Salem Schools and the Brewster Schools. What's all about that? 
Well, it's an opportunity um, that, you know, it's not um, uh, an uncommon uh, kind of situation where if there is a, a, a district that has a team uh, that isn't large enough to have its own team, um, it looks to other districts to see if they can merge teams, and Dean is very familiar with that. So we have, um, uh, at one of our board meetings uh, in the fall, uh, two parents, uh, you know, came to the board meeting and they spoke about, you know, uh, trying to uh, get um, the two teams, the two football teams, North Salem and, and Brewster, merge. And there had been some conversation in the past, and, and you know, I certainly had a conversation with uh, Dr. Freeston, and there had been some conversations in the past about merging, and it didn't, you know, for a variety of reasons, which Mr. Berardo can speak to, uh, it didn't work for us at the time, mm -hmm. uh, but it is not an uncommon, you know, situation to actually try to engage with other teams. Um, what um, I wanted to make sure was conveyed because there was a little mis miscommunication uh, when the, we presented this to our board, which is no fault of Mr. Gerardo, uh, but it, I, I did not want it to appear as though North Salem didn't want to merge, and I think that is what certainly came off and, and what was reported, and I wanted to make sure that that, was, uh, that misperception was erased, uh, that, that, and, and to note that uh, Dr. Freeston and, and, and uh, I uh, had always wanted to uh, merge with our football team, uh, but it, it didn't work out for us, rather than it being that he did not want to. So that, that was the, the main reason why I wanted to make sure that we clarified that. Dean, what would the ramifications be for a merger of this type? Well, um, we presently play a class, what we call class A football. It's all based upon enrollment. And if we added, uh, when you create a merger, the 100% of each school's enrollment is added together. That would be starting next year. So we, if we took on a merger with North Salem, could potentially, potentially play, be playing class AA football, which would put us probably in the lower end, lower bottom uh, part of class AA. We, we would potentially be playing bigger schools, mm -hmm. such as Carmel, mm -hmm. Maypack, New Rochelle, North Rockland, John Jay and Spishko. That could put us at a safety end or a competitive disadvantage. And it's, that's certainly something that Mr. Sasson and I have talked about, the Director of Athletics at North Salem, and certainly he understands it. his concerns or our concerns about this. Sure. And you know, we're going to keep an open mind about enrollment because enrollment's always fluctuating and changing, and the way that they're recorded are always fluctuating and changing, and uh, you know, we'll see where it takes us in the future. But for next year, we're, we're not going to do that. So for the moment, things will remain the same Correct. when it comes to football for Brewster High. Correct. But we'll always look, be open to, Absolutely. you know, speaking with any, uh, you know, uh, other district that mm -hmm. may not have a, 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 a enough student interest to, you know, warrant its own team. So uh, we would certainly are open to uh, uh, entertaining that, at, you know, but it's not for football, but it could be for other types of uh, mergers. And I think Mr. Barreto has examples of other times we that we'll be seeking a merger. We do. We, we are currently, we've had a, a boys swimming merger with John Jay Cross River. Um, for as long as I've been director, mm -hmm. and for the past two years, we have we've had a merger for uh, ice hockey. Mm -hmm. and we also work together with the Pauling School District to uh, host an independent skier. So they, it's technically our team, but they they kind of ski on our roster. It's all legit, and all approved. Yeah, it's it's for the kids. It's for the young children. The Correct. students so want to get out there. It's mm -hmm. all about opportunity and having them participate. And a lot, it's not an uncommon thing throughout, uh, you know, Section One athletics. Okay. Dean, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Henning. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Mr. Toronto. Dean Toronto, <laughs> Director of Athletics here in the Brewster Schools. Talk about bright. Victor Kai, congratulations. Victor took the ACT test last spring. You say, all right, two million kids took it around the country. But only Victor was one of 2,000 who did what? He received a perfect score. Oh. Unbelievable. Is, that is unbelievable. And you know what? Good for him because he obviously worked really yeah. hard, you know, to get there. It, you know, this wasn't, you know, him guessing or choosing to, you know, trying to find a way to game that, 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 that system of the test. But he studied hard. He worked hard. He used his best thinking and, and that was the outcome. So I want to congratulate him and hope that, that that score opens many doors and gets him lots of scholarship money. He downplayed the whole thing, though. He was a very <laughs> soft-spoken young man, which you're going to hear in a minute. And I got the biggest kick when I said, what does this mean to you? He said, I'm proud of my scores, but I have a lot more studying to do before <laughs> entering college. And Victor, by the way, founded the Brewster High School Ping Pong Club last year. So he's an entrepreneur yeah. and a, philanthrop <laughs> a budding philanthropist. Victor, congratulations. 
This handsome young gentleman is Victor Kai, and Victor has achieved something that most high school students don't ever get close to achieving. Victor is one of 2,000 students out of more than 2 million students to receive a score of 36 on his ACTs last year, last spring. Quite an accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you. What does this mean to you? Uh, it is an accomplishment, and I'm happy to get the score that I did because I did work hard for it. Now, well, you are a junior. You'll be in Brewster High next year. What are the plans for the future? Have you decided yet? Uh, well, I do want to go to college, and but I'm undecided as of now. So. Well, you're very involved in the high school here at Brewster High. I understand you founded the Ping Pong Club? Yes, I did this year. I just founded it with two of my other friends. How did that come about? Uh, well, I like ping pong personally, and they did all as well. So we just decided to f found a club, and yeah. And there you go. Yeah. What other organizations are you involved with here at Brewster High? Uh, I'm also in Mu Alpha Theta and the Science Honor Society, as well as Semper Fi. Well, that's wonderful. Well, again, we wish you the best of luck. And just some of the uh, notices here, if I can, uh, the, on average, only around one-tenth of one percent of students take the ACT. They earn that top score. Again, a score of 36, one of 2,000 young men and women from around the United States out of more than 2 million students to receive that composite score. And the chief executive officer of the organization said, quote, your achievement on the ACT is a significant and rare accomplishment, while test scores are just one multiple criteria that most colleges consider, we're sure you're going to be a great success. Well, congratulations one more time. Thank you. Victor Kai, a junior at Brewster High. Faculty in this school district are so dedicated. Two dozen teachers at the CV Star School have decided to give up their free periods and their lunchtime every once in a while, and they actually work with students in need of extra help. That does not surprise me. Our, you know, especially at that level, that teachers recognize that you know it, it's important for us to educate students, and it's important for, for us to make sure that that you know that they get enough, the students get an opportunity to to learn at high levels. But it's also important for children to understand that teachers care about them. So in, in this mentoring program, it's not just the sitting down and going over you know, a math question or, or looking at a writing assignment, but just that interaction with an adult who cares about you, that goes a long way, and children remember that for the rest of their lives. The mentor-mentee program, by the way, under the direction of Allison Mooney and Diane Lamort, we had the opportunity to stop by and chat with the ladies. Let's go back and say hi. CV Star School, the new year, an incredible program is taking place the Mentor Mentee Program, where 25 teachers give up their lunch or prep time to work with students one-on-one. -on -one. With us are Diane Lamord and Allison Mooney, some of the organizers of this great program. And ladies, welcome on the show. Thank How you. did it all begin? Well, I have to say, even before we instituted the program here at CV Star, um, there has been a program in effect down at JFK for several years coordinated by the school social worker Ruth Muller and she was actually a wonderful resource for us um, when we started instituting the program here we had lots of questions about the logistics of forming a new program um, so she was really a, a wonderful resource for us and we also had a, um, an administrator who mm -hmm. was supportive and um, really encouraged us to uh, start a program like that here um, but it really happened more organic than that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right, right, yeah. It, it actually really started because I really saw a need in my own classroom a few years ago where, where some students were, you know, um, just having a hard time, um, you know, in school and not seeming um, like things were just going their way and they just really needed like an outlet somebody an adult somebody that they could turn to someone um, that they would meet with once a week so we actually decided to pilot it just in third grade at first so a lot of the third grade teachers were on board and um, you know giving up their lunches and their preps to meet with students to help build that confidence and to make them happy and to really just be like a shining light in their day um, and it just started taking off and then from there um, we put together um we actually 
built the program up more by adding more teachers and then so many wanted to get involved over the last couple of um, years that we've been doing this um, we've had you know 25 to 30 mentors of teachers you know who are willing to give up their time to be part of this wonderful program and you know it's amazing because I don't think we realize how much we really um, help these students because they aren't always so forthcoming saying oh you know um, I love being with you but that, but you can see the smiles on their faces and you know they can't wait to meet and they're always saying when are we going to be meeting when are we going to be meeting so so we re really feel like there's so many benefits to this program. so the children actually get pleasure out of this yeah absolutely knowing that they're getting that extra help mm -hmm. they need mm -hmm. plus having an interaction with a teacher that they normally wouldn't have exactly it's exactly. that one-on-one -on -one yeah. time that they have um, usually you know they're just sitting like in a quiet place whether they're having lunch together or maybe playing a game um, and just talking about you know what's happening it's not you know it's not counseling it's not anything like that it's really just being sort of like a buddy someone that they can turn to and just have that that total time to themselves mm -hmm. and that's what and that's what's most important and we're hoping you know in turn that's making them feel good about themselves and um, you know in building that confidence mm -hmm. and and just really just you know being a good part of their day well Bruce the teachers one more time go above and beyond the call of duty Keep up the good work, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Great yeah. job. Thanks a lot. Diane, Allison, we thank you. The Mentor Mentee Program, a huge success here at CV Star. And since we're at CV Star, Project Lead the Way. Valerie got such a kick out of this the other day. I got a kick out of it too. So did two members of the Brewster Board of Education, where the students actually designed their own robots. You really see this. This is a, a, a wonderful example of a STEM instruction and, and, and STEM curriculum. Uh, this was the first year at CB Star Intermediate School that we uh, actually uh, set teachers away to be trained and come back to train other teachers. As Mr. Koshal uh, was one of the teachers, uh, Ms. Uh, Megan Johnston, and Ms. Jackie Fago. They went away. They went away last summer, learned, and then came back and 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 taught the principles of that program to other teachers. So uh, teachers are using units, you know, they're trying it out that way. So there it's we still use a science program or a science curriculum and this is this this support this is the supplement to that and this is the uh, a unified way in which we can teach STEM principles so that you know some what, what they get in third grade doesn't look so differently from what they get in fifth grade and that over time they develop those understandings and see those connections and they get a chance to practice you know solving problems and and and, uh, seeing how things are relevant and connected and being able to you know view uh, failure as an opportunity to learn and being able to um, uh, take intellectual risk without you know prompting so it's such an important part of what we believe across the school district and Eric it, we not only have project lead the way at, at CD star we also have two courses at the uh, Wells HH Wells Middle School and two courses at Brewster High School. Mm. So we plan and hope to spread this over time. Next year, we're looking at what's going to happen for K-2. We have two options at K-2. It's so great seeing these youngsters, you know, again, babies, about nine, 10 year old children, how they work with the computers and how they work with technology. And it's just marvelous to see this. And the language they use, they have such sophisticated vocabulary. Yeah. One of the teachers, Ms. Johnson, was explaining that, you know, in the past she might have, you know, front loaded the vocabulary. She might have taught that first, taught the concepts first, and then gone into the applications. It's completely reversed. Mm. They go into the application and then they learn why they did that. And then they practice you know, using the vocabulary, then they can really see the connections and the understandings and the relevance. So it's a powerful form of learning and we, you know, every student should have that access. And, and you know what, Eric? It builds that pipeline, that STEM pipeline, you know, from the, our, our youngest children all the way to, to uh, high school. And so as children, you know, go through the system, many of them are learning, you know, well, these are careers that I might be interested in. So it has that component as well. So it's learning the principles of engineering and thinking deeply and, 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 and purposefully, but also thinking about what they may want to do. And Mr. Koshal mentioned that one of his young women, and one of his, his girls in the class, said to him the other day, she wants to become an engineer. Let's meet some of these budding engineers right now on Spotlight on Booster Schools. Go! Oh, oh, you went backwards. Careful. All right, those are in the water. You got to go for different ones. No, you can Hurry up, Kaylee. Go, go, go. Wait, it's not connected. 
What the hell? What are you doing? You're supposed to put them into the air. Oh, relax. Yeah. Pose. Pose. Yeah. Get it again. It's 30. You have plenty of time. You have a minute and a half. Keep going, Haley. No, don't go on the red. Sorry. Oh, wait. Just get those. It's called Project Lead the Way. Valerie, this is an amazing, an amazing exhibition. Young people designing their own little robots and playing games on the floor. And the girls are beating the boys. And guess what? They're learning the principles of engineering. So this is the pipeline that we need to build to get our children ready so that when they go into the middle school and the high school that they're taking many more of these STEM uh, types of courses where they are designing, they are thinking about, you know, what it means, how do you, you know, how do you solve problems, and how do, how do you, how things are connected, and and what do you need to do to to change them? And there's a lot of opportunity for failure because failure is is an opportunity to learn. So this is an amazing um, e example of what should be in all of our classrooms. And we have a fabulous teacher, Mr. Koshal, who uh, his, you know, was telling me about the differences that it's made for children, how it's improved and increased their science and their math skills. So it's awesome. Steve, you know, you've been a teacher for how many years now? 31 years. 31 now. years. This is, must be one of the highlights. So when you see these young kids like that, babies, 10-year-old kids, 5th graders, coming up with these wonderful designs like that. Yeah, no, this is really neat. I mean, I have been doing this a long time, and this is brand new for the, for the district, and uh, it, it's the future. I mean, it really, and it's building more than just robots. It's all the skills we're working on to get to be better builders, and, and we're going to be engineers. So... Sonia Masika, Diane O'Brien, members of the Board of Education. Sonia, what do you think about something like this? You know what? What's exciting is to see their excitement and just their use of vocabulary and how they just jump right into the work they're doing and want to share. I mean, you know, they don't even know who we are, but they're just right there. Look what we've done, and it's, it's amazing to see. No. Diane, just a little different than when we went to school. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> very different. And, and it was funny, I was asking some of the children, you know, is, is, how do you think about learning this way? And they're, the excitement, and they're all like, this is my favorite, and it's so much better than learning the old way. And, you know, I'm like, is, you know, is this your favorite class? And outside of a, well, lunch is good, but <laughs> the, it, it was right up there. So I was, it was very exciting to see and, and just the excitement and the learning and the vocabulary. It's just wonderful, wonderful. They talk about the future is now. It's now in the Brewster schools. It is, and it's going to expand. So while Mr. Koshal, uh, Ms. Johnson, and Ms. Fager were the teachers who went away this summer to, to be trained so that they could come back and train others, they are integrating certain units. So we're still using a, fa you know, a curriculum uh, for, you know, for science that we've used for some time. But this is a, a way to integrate real STEM practices into instruction, and we hope to build it over time so that it's in every grade, you know, in every school, and that every child has an opportunity to explore, to learn, and, and to also, you know, explore poss you know, poss possibilities of careers that they'd like to, you know, uh, be, you know, sort of learn about or, or find themselves, you know, going to college or, or trade school or wherever to learn about. Okay, as we say, exciting things happen every day in the Brewster School District. A busy week throughout the Brewster Schools. Uh, our guests from the Tri-State Consortium visited. What is the Tri-State Consortium? The, the Tri-State Consortium is a group of critical friends. They're educators from across the district and other districts that subscribe to and are, are, are part of uh, the, the, the consortium. So it's basically a way in which you know, districts can learn from other districts by going and be a part, a part of a visit, where that school that wants you to visit is really looking at you know, the way in which they implemented a, you know, an approach for us. It was They were here helping us to look at, you know, is there buy-in for our strategic coherence plan mm -hmm. across the system? And, and and how well do people understand you know, what these skills are and why they're important? So that was really important information for us to have. And then they give us feedback about that, and they're going to generate a report. So that's going to be a basis for how we look at ourselves. You know, what are the opportunities that we have to, you know, do something differently, or to, or to emphasize something else, or or just continue to do what we're doing. So that's a very valuable form of collaborative inquiry and learning from others, and um, and having critical friends to, you know, who are 
are, are invested in your success. Michelle Gosh, I understand, was the point two person, as I say. She developed all the plans with a team. She said that she had a strategic coherence plan, I mean, a tri state steering committee uh, made up of, of some educators and administrators in the district, and they developed, they scoped out the three days. And that's the commitment from the district. It's three days. Um, uh, they, we collect evidence. That evidence is part of what, what tells the story about what the district is doing. There are lots of interviews, Eric. There are you know, uh, visits to classrooms. Uh, lots of people are involved. Our board of education mm -hmm. members, our parents, children. So it was just a very you know, um, impressive way in which uh, we could you know, step back and have some objective feedback from some good friends. OK, Michelle, good seeing you again. Michelle Gosh, the Assistant Superintendent of Schools, is smiling these days. Why, you ask? Because the Tri-State visit has come and gone. A lot of work went into this project. Michelle spearheaded the whole drive. What is the Tri-State? So the Tri-State Consortium is a, an organization of districts across New York, um, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And it serves as our accreditation process, um, but it's really about professional learning. And for districts, it, they create a process that districts take a really intense look. They hold up a mirror um, so that we can see what are we really doing well and how can we improve to better serve our students. Now, these are educators from different school districts in the three states. Yes, we hosted about 15 <laughs> superintendents and assistant superintendents, uh, a few teachers um, from uh, probably about eight different school districts. Um, and they came in and, and uh, immersed themselves in the district for three days. They conducted interviews. Um, they were able to observe some of our, our classes and also looked at evidence around two essential questions that we, that we established about our strategic coherence plan. And once the information is gleaned, is returned to Brewster, what happens to it then? Well, that's one of the more, more uh, important pieces. I mean, the first piece is that we, as a system, are able to take a moment and sort of celebrate all the work that's been done system-wide system, system -wide K-12, um, which, you know, you forget because there's such a, a, a um, almost frenzy to make sure that we show our best selves mm -hmm. to, to the, our visitors. Um, but it was nice to take a moment and to say, oh, look at all the evidence, look at all the hard work that the system has done already, and we, we thank the staff for that. Um, but after the, the visit, they give us a, they debriefed with us on Friday and largely affirmed a lot of the efforts that have been going on uh, district-wide. Um, and then they'll, they'll issue a written report. And what we'll do then is bring those um, results back to our strategic coherence planning team and we'll use it in our visioning and next steps moving forward. Not every school district is part of this Tri-State, are they? No, that's a, that's a great question. And Dr. Jane Sandbank, when she was superintendent, um, made sure that we were able to join the consortium. Um, I don't know if there are any other schools in Putnam um, that are part of the consortium. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but it is a, an organization that is really intensely focused on student learning. And um, they provide a, 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 a lot of support for us. Um, in order to uh, best serve the needs of our students. And of course, the information that does come back is used in a positive light in the Bruce schools. Absolutely. They serve as critical friends. So they tell us what we need to know. And, and that's what the, the goal of those three days was, for them, us to hear from key, key stakeholders to see what are we doing well and what can we do to better to improve. So that information is, is welcome. Um, and we look forward to seeing the, the report and, again, using... Um, that in our visioning moving forward. When should the report come back? Probably in, in a couple of weeks. Um, it depends on who the uh, facilitator or the, the lead of the, the visit is, but I anticipate a couple of That'll weeks. That'll be made, made public as well? Yes, yes, that should be. Okay, well, uh, thank And I would just like to thank, if you don't mind, the steering committee. Sure. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Frank Samperlin, Mrs. Ashley Cunningham, uh, Mrs. Teresa Cherry, uh, Maggie Andriello, uh, Mr. John Clark, um, Mrs. Deb Romain, Mrs. Nikki Horler, um, and uh, Mrs. Tracy Villaverde, as well as Mr. Jim Trelor, and of course, uh, Patty Lawler, who, <laughs> <laughs> who right is the, yes, absolutely <laughs> made sure every detail um, was taken care of and, and helped to make the visit flawless. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Let's see you. You too. Michelle Gosh, assistant principal, and when that report comes back, we'll let you know how we made out. I'm sure we made out very well. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> No Name Calling Week in Brewster High School. Very interesting concept. Uh, Rebecca Archer from the Gay Straight Alliance, and Rebecca is the faculty advisor. This is something that is near and dear to all of us. Well, 
well, you know, our students are aware as they walk the hallways and they, you know, or they have friends who tell them that they're the recipients of name calling. That does exist. And, you know, we can pretend, you know, that, you know, uh, students are not doing that, but we know they are. They're reporting it. They're telling us that they are. And this was an effort led by the Gay, the Gay Straight Alliance to, to, to find some way in which you can get students and, and the adults talking about this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they talked indeed. Some people were uncomfortable, but that was sort of part of the, the whole installation is to have people think about it. And it's every known uh, slur, you know, that, that students have, some of the students in the Gay Straight Alliance heard themselves that they'd been victims of those slurs. Uh, and there were five display cases, Eric, of, of the uh, with t-shirts with pieces of strips of tape on it that with different slurs. And through, throughout the installation, you saw the message, no name calling. We don't tolerate name calling. This is wrong. And that was the message, that, that as they hear those words, if they develop a sensitivity about how they should not be using them, and if they hear them used against other students, that they step up, that they become upstanders, not bystanders, where they watch it, they hear it, and they don't do anything about it. And you know what? Some of this, some, you know, Sometimes our uh, adults in, in, in our schools are uncomfortable or, or reticent to approach it. And this really provoked converse, some good conversation. And, and bravo to our students for seeing this as an avenue for pursuing that, you know, just taking it on boldly rather than maybe having a lesson where some students talked and then the rest didn't. This put it right out in the center of the, the school. And I, I applaud them for, for, for taking on this bold move and that it, it did get us talking. And it, it was necessary, as we know, from you know an incident that happened last summer. So right. this really did, you know, do something that I thought was, you know, more significant than anything else that we've done today. We talked to Rebecca Archer and a sophomore at Brewster High, Gabby Fragliosi, right here. No name calling week at Brewster High School. We're here with Rebecca Archer and Gabby Fragliosi. Rebecca is the faculty advisor of the Gay Straight Alliance here at Brewster High. Gabby is a sophomore, member of the organization. Rebecca, what's all this about? Well, we started with a program called with GLSEN, which is the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. Uh, it's a nationwide, um, and they have a number of resources um, and different events throughout the year, and No Name Calling Week was um, just this past week in January, uh, and we wanted to be representatives of that here at Brewster High School. So our GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance, um, a club here at Brewster High School, um, we wanted to partake in that. Um, so we put a display into the art hallway um, to show our support and as part of a no name calling an anti-bully campaign. More or less challenging students to think about slurs against each other and why name calling is not okay. Correct. So really the display was bringing attention to the issue and awareness to name calling um, and how when we name call, the person takes on that label. So what can we do to bring awareness to this so that we can stop this behavior, stop labeling people, um, and bring a little bit more um, compassion and awareness to our fellow students here? How has the program been received? Uh, the program has mostly positive reviews. There's always like you know a few sly mouths, but nothing too bad. And it's actually given like I obviously have queer friends and friends who aren't state or don't identify with the uh, gender uh, the gender they were born with. And GSA has really given them a place to like thrive and feel themselves and just feel safe in school, you know, whether they don't have that safe space at their house or like where they or live or they just don't feel safe with their friend group, GSA is like a place where you're always going to be accepted. And no matter what is different about you, we, we embrace that and we make sure that you're proud of what you are and proud of what you do. Now, when does the organization meet? After school, once a month? How does that work? Uh, after school, every Thursday. Sometimes we have extra meetings if we have like exciting news or something, but usually every Thursday after school. So the club is a viable organization at Brewster High School and getting that message out there. It certainly is. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you, Gabby. And you're watching Inside Brewster Schools. Where are you going to be in the year 2031, my dear? Um, I'm probably still going to be working. <laughs> <laughs> 
doing really doing something that I that like I'm doing now that I enjoy and I feel it's you know making a positive contribution to the society. We're talking about 12 years from now, <laughs> not, not that long. It's actually, not. 13 years from now, because that's the class of 2031 at Brewster High, which means kindergarten registration is right around the corner. It is, and this is an exciting time for JFK Elementary School. Uh, we get ready to introduce the next set of students who you know are going to come into the school district. It's typically a, a class of maybe about 180. That's our current enrollment, and every year it tends to be that or you know maybe you know 10 or more students you know one way or the other uh, the registration will be February 26th to March 2nd uh, there are important documents that parents have to bring with their children such as um, their proof of uh, immunization uh, which you know uh, is very important uh, in a school district uh, their current back their current physical their current physical exam uh, registration information so birth certificate all those things are brought and if there are any questions uh, parents should contact uh, the school and they'll be very happy to, to guide uh, you through what documents are, are necessary. That's 279-2087, extension 4111. 279-2087, extension 4111. Make your appointment today. Absolutely. We okay. welcome our new kindergartners. We look Good. forward to seeing okay. them. Okay. Wow. That was a jam-packed show. Well, we are a busy, committed <laughs> district. Thank you. Superintendent of Schools, Valerie Henning Piedmont, we'd like to thank you again for joining us for this edition of Spotlight on Brewster Schools. Frankie, thank you for your able assistance. Until next time, for Val, I'm Eric Rose. Bye-bye now. Good day.